late start, another technical issue there. This time to do with our service provider. Um, all right, let's go through some admin for the week. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to um, ask Leo um, and I will, um, and he can pass them on to me and I'll, I'll try and answer them for you. First of all, don't forget assignment two. We've got two deliverables. One was due this, uh, a, sh a short while ago. Another one is due at the end of the week. The reason why the deliverable is due at the end of the week is it would have been due on Monday, except we've got a public holiday next Monday. And also, um, uh, so, so it's due before the weekend. So it's not a huge deliverable and it means you don't have to think about this over the weekend. It also means your tutors don't have to mark it. Um, uh, just the, the, they don't have to get the deliverable on a public holiday and you don't have to work on a public holiday. All right, that's, um, don't forget to check when the deliverables are due. It's all very clear list on the course webpage. And don't forget to think very carefully about your ownership and originality statements. Um, and make sure that if you're having troubles with um, um, who, 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 who contributed to things, your know, contribution statements, make sure that if you're really um, not working this out that you um, discuss it with your tutor, okay? If there are problems, you feel like you're getting bullied in your group or anything bad like that, please go straight to your tutor and um, if necessary, they'll escalate it to me. Um, don't forget also in the labs, you can work through assignment problems with your tutor. And one thing I've noticed, a few people don't seem to be aware that we have one-to-one -one drop in sessions. We have nine of them every week, nine, nine drop in sessions. Um, you should make the most of them. They're listed on the course webpage next to the, um, the lab times. They're actually uh, scheduled to be in the first hour of every lab, but you can go to any of them. They're open to everyone. Um, and you can go there and you can get a one-to-one -one consultation with a tutor for one hour. And there, there are nine opportunities a week. So if you're having any questions, whether it be about the assignment or just you, maybe you feel like you're struggling, please make, make use of that opportunity. It's a great resource um, and please make the most of it. So there are nine hours in which you can uh, have a one-to-one -one with a tutor. I want to all remind you again of this. I, I, I put this on the slide on um, last Friday. This is a talk tomorrow at 11 o'clock tomorrow. Um, I'm chairing this talk and uh, there, there's two people here um, and they're both PhDs from ANU and she is uh, my former student, is an amazing guy, amazing um, former PhD student of mine and they're both at Twitter and um, they're going to um, have an open-ended discussion about uh, their careers, their background and what it's like working in a large tech company and um, you can go to them, you can go to this talk and you can ask questions like, you know, for example, if you want to ask questions about interviewing for a company like this or what it's like to work for a large company like that or what sort of problems they solve. Come along and ask the questions, and um, and they're, they're both really friendly guys, and I'm sure they'll, they'll they'll be really keen to try and answer your questions. Now, Leo, were there any other questions on admin from anyone? Uh, no. Not nope. Yet. Okay, great. Let's move on then to our um, to the substantive discussion for today, which is um, hashing for, hashing applications. Is the first one. Now, those of you who were at the lecture on um, Friday, and hopefully everyone was, but of course some of you won't be, or maybe you've seen, seen the um, lecture recording. Um, what we talked about was hash functions. Now it's unit C2. We're now talking about applications of hashing. And if you were there, you will have remembered I worked work through an example of a basketball tournament with our class. And the idea was that we wanted to uh, assign everyone into a team. So um, take every student in the class and assign them into uh, one of 16 teams. And we wanted to make sure that each week the same student would always go back into the same team. That was one of the conditions. So that meant it was what we call deterministic. So it always gave the same result. Each student always landed in the same team. So if you're in team number two this week, you're gonna be in team number two next week. That was one of the goals. Another goal was that the teams were evenly distributed, which means that the teams have even sizes. So if we drew a histogram, you'd see that the, the, the bars on the histogram were pretty even in size, okay? It's hard to get them perfectly even, but at least they'd be pretty even. That was another goal we had. And the solution we came up with, um, I think someone in class suggested it, is we took the student's university ID number and used that as a key and um, then we did integer division by 16 and the remainder for each student would be a number between 0 and 15 and that would determine their team. So basically you'd figure out your team simply by looking at your university ID number. And each week, of course, you get the same um, team because your university ID number hasn't changed and division doesn't change, right? So that was a hash function, okay? That was a hash function. 
Now, um, and so I've given you one example, one kind of slightly silly example of an application of hashing, and that was making basketball teams. And I started that whole discussion with saying, imagine we had two teams, and then we talked about doing it in terms of odds and evens. If your university ID was odd, then go that way. If it's even, go that way. And of course, next week, you're gonna have the same UID, so you're gonna go that way and that way, the same as last week, so it's still deterministic. And then we generalized it to say you could have it for however many teams you wanted, and if it was 16 teams, then you just use division by 16 and take the remainder. All right, now I wanna talk more about applications. And um, one thing I wanna, uh, one, one little running example I wanna give you is um, my time years ago as an undergrad um, in a dorm, right, in a residential dorm at University of New South Wales. And in those days, we used to get um, letters in the post. I don't know if any of you ever have even seen these things, but you know, like a paper envelope with a letter inside it from your mum and your dad. Um, and uh, they were delivered every day, and usually after your morning lectures, you come and have lunch, and then you go and check your mail, right? You check your mail. So I want you to think about how you distributed mail to 250 or so students all living in one location, right? So one way they could have done it, which I don't suggest to be a good way to do it, would be to grab all the mail, it would be a huge mail bag, and just dump it on the floor, right? Just dump it on the floor, just dump all the stuff there. So you think about it, if, if I wanted to go get my letters, then um, if there's a giant pile of letters on the floor, I'd just have to go through every single one and look until I found one that was addressed to me, okay? So what's the complexity of that? Well, it means I've, the complexity is that I've got to go through every single one of those on average until I can be sure that there's none left. Um, you know, if, unless I look at every single one, I can't know that the ones I haven't looked at aren't actually for me. So I've got to go through every single piece of mail, right? Okay, so we didn't do that, needless to say. What they did instead was they had um, what we call mailboxes or pigeonholes, and there were 26 of them. I think it may not have actually been 26, but it's essentially 26 of them, and one for each letter of the alphabet, okay? And then what happens, instead of just chucking the whole bag of mail on the floor, they put them into these pigeonholes according to the first letter of your last name. So there's one with the letter B on there, and I went there, and then there was the mail for the people whose last name started with the letter B. So what's happened to the problem that I have in terms of finding my mail? Well, instead of looking through, imagine that they got on average 300 letters a day. Instead of having to look through 300, I might have had to look through 10. So I pick out 10, or however many is, are going to people whose last names start with B, pull them out of the thing, and I look through all 10 of them one by one to see if any of them are for me, okay? So what's happened there is we've reduced the amount of searching I've needed to do. Instead of searching through 300 letters, I'm now searching through um, just 10, right? Hopefully this makes sense, right? So we've reduced the complexity of the search. And that's, uh, I, that, that example there is a slightly silly example, but hopefully it illustrates really crisply for you this concept of using a hash. Oh, what's the hash, by the way? What, what is the hash in that example? The hash function in that example takes my last name, that's the key, and extracts the first letter, which is the letter B in my case, and that's the function. So the function is take that and then map it to a, a, a box which has a letter of the alphabet on it, A through Z. Okay, so that's the hash function. The function says take the name, Blackburn, take the first letter, and then put it to one of the um, 26 boxes accordingly, and it will go to B. All right, that's a hash function. And um, let's move on now and um, talk about some stuff that's related to this. First of all, we're now talking about applications, so we're now talking about Java. And the first thing to know, and this is actually very important, you don't want to forget this, because you're definitely going to get questions about it later, um, is that Java has its own built-in hash code function, okay? Every object in Java has a hash code, which means that for any object, you can call the hash code method and it will give you a function back, right? Remember the, the function, um, the hash function in the example I just gave took the, took the object, if you want, or the string, if you want, Blackburn, and returned the letter B. So it's a function which takes a string, which happens to be Blackburn, and returns the letter B. That's one function. Here, what's gonna happen is any object, whether it be a person, whether it be an elephant, whether it be a bike, or whatever, it's gonna take that and return an integer, okay? That's what the function is, and, and Java provides this, okay? Now, it's implemented in Java Lang object, which means that every object in all of Java has a hash code. So it means for any object, you can always ask for the hash code for that object, 
right? There's a special rule, uh, that, and you're allowed to override it. You can override it, which is interesting. Um, but there's a special rule that says if an object has the equal, uh, if two objects are equal according to the equals method, then they must have the same hash code. Okay? So there's a relationship between hash code and equal. That is not, it's very important that you understand, that is not the same as saying if they've got the same hash code, they must be equal. That's absolutely not what it's saying. What it's saying is if they're equal according to the equals function, then they must have the same hash code. Okay, the inference goes in one direction, it's not in both directions, okay? So if they're equal, they must have the same hash code. Which means that if you redefine equality, which you're allowed to do, then you also must make sure the hash codes match. It's a very important point. And the hash need not be perfect. In fact, remember what perfect hash is. A ha perfect hash means that everything, uh, the function ensures that everything in the set Right, so in the case of my example, the residential hall, that's 250 students or whatever, everything that's set returns a different hash. That's not, the tr not true in the example I gave you, because in that case, uh, there was only 26 values, the, the letters of the alphabet, and there are 256, uh, 250 inputs. Okay, so that's definitely not a perfect one. They could have made a perfect hash by having 250 pigeonholes and putting 250 pigeonholes across the wall of the dining room instead of 26. And then they could have had a perfect hash, a hash which goes directly from each name to a particular pigeonhole, right? Now, what's the disadvantage of that? Well, the, well, the advantage is that I don't have to look through 10 letters every time I want to see if I've got mail. Um, the disadvantage is it's going to take an awful lot of room in the dining room if you're going to put um, up 250 of these pigeonholes instead of just 26, right? So roughly 10 times as much space. So that's the disadvantage, okay? Now, that's what a perfect hash was. We talked about that in the last lecture. And what, uh, in terms of the Java hash code, it says that it doesn't need to be perfect, which means that two objects can have the same hash even if they're not equal, okay? So two objects that are not equal may have the same hash. The previous point, the line above, says that if two objects are equal, they must have the same hash. And hopefully you can understand these two points aren't contradictory at all, okay? So in fact, we're allowed to change hash code. In fact, the, 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 the JVM, that's Java, like OpenJDK, does not guarantee you that the hash is necessarily a very good one. Remember what makes a good hash? A good hash is one where the buckets are evenly filled. Now, if it's a 32-bit signed integer, there's four billion buckets, okay? That's what, uh, to the power 32 gives you about 4 billion, right? Um, and it, that means that roughly each one of those would be evenly filled, right? But um, Java doesn't guarantee you that. In fact, it's actually completely legal for Java just to return the same value for every object. It would satisfy everything on that slider in front of you. So it could say that the hash code for every object is the number zero, right? And, and, and that still satisfies everything on that slide. It would be very, very unhelpful if it did that because you couldn't use it for much if it always returned the same value. It would be pretty useless hash, but it would be consistent with all these things. And what that means is it would be correct in the sense it doesn't violate any rules, but pretty useless. So um, its usefulness isn't part of the correctness criteria. That's another way of saying it. So there's four correctness criteria here. Usefulness or efficiency is not one of those criteria. Of course, in practice, anyone building a JVM would want to make sure that it is useful, okay? Because no one wants to build useless stuff. So in fact, we don't always return zero. We try to give you as close as we can to a perfect hash. All right, um, what are the uses of hashing? Well, one use is to create what we call a hash table, and we're gonna cover that in a minute. Now, you may remember back a few lectures ago, we talked about maps, okay? Maps is a concept, we're gonna come back to that uh, in, in, a, in uh, thing week nine, we're gonna come, come back to that again. But maps is an important concept. A hash table is a mapping from a key to a value, okay? A mapping from a key to a value. So we can implement a hash table using a hash, okay? We're gonna talk about that in great detail today, all right? Pruning a search. What does it mean to prune a search? If you understood my example with a mail, you understand exactly what I mean by pruning a search. Instead of having to search through 250 items of mail and look to see if any of them had, were addressed to me, I could just look through 10 or whatever, however many landed in the B pigeonhole, right? So the, the search is dramatically reduced. And it also means that if you want to um, find out if there are duplicates, it's much more efficient because if, if two things are duplicated, if there's two names Blackburn, for example, they're gonna land in the same hash if you're hashing on the name, right? So it becomes a lot easier to find them um, using a hash, okay? Rather than having to look through everything and sort, 
Okay, you don't need to sort. All you have to do is hash and say, okay, if they were the same, they would have the same hash, so we can see. And likewise, there's similar values. You can find all the ones that start with B and put them together. All right, so that's pruning a search. Very useful property. Compression. A hash is typically much more compact than the key. Okay, um, that's a very important point as well. Now, you see in the, in the, in the example of the basketball game, of course, right, you saw that... Um, that the, the key was your UID, which had, I think, seven digits, right? Um, whereas the basketball team is only 16, um, 16 values. So that's just like um, um, four bits, right? So that's far more compact. Of course, it's lossy. That means I can't tell. If you give me the hash, I can't go back and tell you what the original UID was. If I said, okay, this person's in, in um, team three, that doesn't tell me what the UID is, it just tells me it could be any one of all the different UIDs that are in that team, right? So, but we can use it for compression. Okay, that's a very important technique, but it's going to be, it's often lossy compression. Correctness. Checksums can confirm inequality. Now, I'm going to ask Leo a question in a second here. Um, correctness, um, this is a question I normally ask someone in the room because it totally sucks that we're not in, a, in an actual classroom right now, but um, Checksums can confirm inequality. This is a really carefully worded statement. What does that mean? Confirm inequality. What You can't tell if two things are the same with a checksum, but you can tell if two things have different checksums, they must be different. Okay? So two things that have the same checksum or the same hash, if two things have the same hash, they may be the same. If two things have different hashes, they are definitely different. Okay? So... Different hashes, or checksums, tell you that two things are different. If they have the same hash, you don't know if they're different, but they might be. Okay? So um, that's what the word confirm inequality. Now, uh, my, my question for Leo is uh, I'm going to get him to try and read my mind, right? So I'm guessing of a Boolean. I've got a Boolean in my head. The Boolean, I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's going to be either true or false. I want Leo to guess what Boolean I've got in my head here. Leo, you, you, you got a guess? Um, I will go with true. Okay, so Leo said true, he's wrong. Okay, he's wrong. Um, so Leo, can you guess what it is that's in my head? Well, it, then there will be false. <laughs> right, okay, so Leo's correctly guessed it's false. <laughs> this, this seems ridiculous, right? But it's a very important point. And that is to say that if, if you're dealing with Booleans and someone tells you a Boolean is incorrect, you already know what the, the answer is. Right? It's, it's kind of obvious, but it's actually a really interesting subtle point. And this actually comes into hashing applications as we'll show in a moment. It's a very cool property and you might think that's a rid ridiculous thing to say that, well, I said I had in my head uh, false and, uh, and Leo says true and then I, then I say it's the opposite, then of course he knows what it is. Right? But um, it, it's a very powerful property. All right, and we're going to come to that right now. So the first one I wanted to highlight was the Loon algorithm. Now, if you've ever put a credit card into a web form, you may know that the web form can tell, can notice a typo in your credit card number without even going to the server. There's an algorithm that tells it with a 90% probability that you've typed the wrong one. How does that work? Pretty simple. It uses a very cool algorithm, which is related to Lund's algorithm, which says, let's take all the digits in your credit card number, except the last one, except the last one, we'll take all these credit uh, uh, digits in the credit card number, add the digits up, right? So it's, you know, three, seven, one, three, or whatever, add all those digits up, right? And you get a number like 150, right? 157, 100, say, it's, say it's 157, right? You add all those digits up, you get a number, 157. Then what you do is you take, you divide that number by 10, and take the remainder, which is seven, right? 157 integer remainder of divide by 10 is seven. Then you write that number as the last number for the credit card. So now you've got all those digits and seven at the end, all right? Now, if someone gets your, if you go and type your credit card number into a web form, and what they can do is they can check if that's still true. So they can add up all the numbers except the last one and take the integer um, remainder after dividing, dividing by 10 and see if it adds up. And if it doesn't, then they know someone, somewhere you made a mistake, okay? Because they need to match, all right? Um, so that is an error detecting algorithm, which is really useful. It doesn't tell you always if there's an error, but for sure it can tell you 90%, okay? So if those th two things don't add up, you definitely have an error. If they do add up, you probably don't have an error, okay? It's very important you understand that. If they don't agree, 
there is definitely an error. If they um, do agree, 90% chance you don't have an error, but not 100% chance, okay? 90% chance you don't have an error. That's a really interesting property. And that goes back to the last point here. Checksums can confirm inequality. It means that if they disagree, then you know there's an error, okay? But if they agree, it doesn't mean you, that you know it's right. It just means that with 90% probability, whatever, whatever their function is, it's, it's correct. Hamming codes are really cool. Hamming codes are error correcting codes. And that's what I alluded to with a, with a silly thing with um, Leo there. And they're these codes that can identify an error and it can actually tell you how to fix the error. Because if they can tell you that, oh, that bit there is wrong. If they say, look, there's, there's, there's 32 bits here and bit number seven is wrong and you've got zero there, well, what should bit number seven be? Well, it has to be one, okay? And, and the Hamming codes are really cool. And if you ever did, if, if you ever have the, the opportunity, try study coding theory um, in maths. I don't know what ANU offers, but I studied co coding theory when I was an undergrad and it was actually very, very cool. I had a bunch of things like this and they're really, really useful in computer science. And the Hamming code's one example. And we use these all the time. You, you may not realize it, but it's, it's probably in your laptop and so forth. Error correcting, um, code, error correcting codes are in your memory and that helps um, detect and fix um, errors in your memory, which can happen all the time. They don't happen very frequently, but they can happen randomly from things like um, uh, cosmic rays and so forth. That can actually literally happen to your laptop occasionally and they can be corrected by error correcting memory. All right, um, just a couple more practical examples. One of my favorites is rsync. Um, if you don't know what rsync is, uh, look it up on Wikipedia. It was developed by Andrew Tridgell, who's another ANU alum. Um, in fact, we did our PhDs together. He was a, a friend of mine when I was doing my PhD. And um, he developed this algorithm during his PhD. In fact, it's part of his PhD work. Uh, ultimately, it wasn't supposed to be part of his PhD, but it became part of his PhD. Um, and what he used it for is to um, move across a slow, yeah, back in those days we had slow dial-up modems, to move the entire Linux source tree from here to here, but only moving differences. So basically what he'd do is, uh, during the day at work, he'd work on the Linux source tree at work, and then when he got home, he wanted to pull all the changes back home but he, because the, mod, the modems are so slow, to drag the entire Linux source code across a, a little modem to his home would just take way too long. And he developed this algorithm that would find only the differences and transmit just the differences. How to do that is kind of magic. It's very, very cool. And the technique was using hashing and using checksums. Okay, checksums are a kind of hash. Okay, and that's exactly how it worked. And it's a very, very cool algorithm. If you have time, I encourage you to go look at it. It's a very cool algorithm. Uh, MD5, you may have heard that. That's another way of, um, sim, uh, it's another hashing te uh, application. It's where we um, can encode a password. So you type in your password, you know, um, whatever it might be, you, your password, and it, it compresses that into a special little code and the code gets stored in a file on the computer. And, um, and then we can check to see, when, then, then later on when someone types the pass, password in, we can see, oh, did, did, we don't actually record your password, we just record the MD5 sum of your password, and then we can check to see if what they typed didn't match the MD5 sum. All right, with that, we're ready for the mini quiz, and then we're gonna move on to, uh, where is Piazza? I've lost my window here. I had a little, um, minor emergency at the start of the class because, uh, this will take me a moment here, because um, the streaming service I have, just uh, OBS couldn't find it for whatever reason. All right, it's there now. Okay, so I've just posted the, um, the poll. And what we're gonna do now is move on to the next thing which is related, and we're going to look at sets. Okay, we're gonna look at sets. We needed to know about hashing and um, hashing applications before we could do this unit, but now we've done that, we can look at sets. I'm just gonna have a drink of my cup of tea here. So let's look at sets. Now hopefully you'll all remember what a mathematical set is. Um, it's the properties of a set are just listed on the slide there. We don't allow, uh, allow duplicates. So if I've got um, a bowl of fruit and we think of that as a set, if I have apple in my set, and I have orange in my set and someone says add apple, it doesn't change the set. The set still contains apple and orange. It doesn't have any concept of two oranges or two apples or anything like that. It just says they exist or they don't exist. So if I add an apple to my set and then an orange and then I, and I add apple repeatedly, it doesn't change the set. The set is just still apple orange, okay? Similarly, there's no notion of order. The set just says there exist apples in the set, there, exi there, there, there exists one or more apple, there exists one or more orange, 
and there's no concept of what order they're in. This is very different to a list. In a list, we do allow duplicates and we do allow order. In fact, order is always preserved in a list. In a set, it's not preserved, so there's no concept of ordering, and um, there is uh, no concept of duplicates, okay? So the sort of operations you can have on a set are create, which creates an empty set, add, which adds an element to a set, contains, tells you whether or not this set contains a particular thing, and remove, takes the thing out of the set, all right? This is a set interface that we're going to um, use. It's a simplified version of um, the set that um, Java offers, right? So it's got add, contains, size, and remove. Now, before I go too much further, I want to ask you all, and I want you to put your answers into the chat if you can. Um, can we implement a set? I want you to think about how we can implement a set. We're going to go and do it in just a few moments. But I want you to think about how we can implement a set. And concretely, I want you to answer this question. Can we implement a set using a linked list? Can we implement a set using a linked list? I want you to put your answers in the chat. Can we implement a set using a linked list? You all know what a set is now. You all know what a linked list is now. Can we implement a set using a linked list? That's my question for you. As soon as Leo's got an answer, I'll, I'll continue. Did you get an answer there, Leo? Yes, I got one from Yuchen. Um, mm -hmm. He said yes, but also Felix said yes, and Adam said no. Um, all right. Yeah, I also got the response with justification. Um, he said yeah, but it will be time consume, uh, time costing. All right. Well, that, that okay. So for those of you, in case you can't hear what Leo is saying, so the answers were: some people said yes. Some people said no, and another person said yes, but it will be time consuming. That last answer was a great answer, okay? The answer is yes, we can implement a set using a linked list, okay? But it's not a great way to do it. But my question was, can we do it? And the answer is yes, we can. So let's have a look at it, okay? And you might think, why is Steve doing this? This is crazy. It's motivating, okay? It'll help you understand what we're gonna do next, okay? It's very, very important to understand that you can implement a set using a linked list, but that's a bad way to do it. So let's have a quick look, okay? So that, there's a bunch of stuff we're gonna put in our set, a bunch of fruit, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add these into a, a linked list like that, okay? So that could be our set representing two, four, six, eight, ten. 10 different fruit in this set. Notice there's no duplicates, and um, although the linked list is ordered, the set has no concept of order, okay? So that is a set of fruit implemented using a linked list, okay? So someone, I didn't catch their name, someone said this is a bad way to do it, but you can do it. They were right, you can do it, but why is it bad? Well, let's think about what I need to do if I wanna add something to this set, okay? If I wanna add, imagine I wanna add, um, I don't know, say I wanna add figs, okay? Another fruit, fig. I wanna add it to the set. What do I need to do before I can add it? Think about it. I need to check whether there are any figs in the set. How do I do that? Well, I have to walk through this linked list and see if any of these things equals fig, okay? And I get to the end and I get to grape, and there isn't anything there called fig, so I can add my extra node in there and say, yep, we've got a fig in our set now, okay? And the problem with that is that it means that every time I add something, I've got to look at everything in the set before I can know whether or not I can add this thing, all right? That's not great. And likewise, if I, have a, if I use the contains operator to find out if it does contain apple, well, apple's easy to find. That's the first thing in the list. But what about grape? To find out if it's got grape in there, I've got to go all the way to the end. In fact, I can't say that something is definitely not in there until I've exhausted the whole list. I can't be sure until I've looked at everything. Okay? It's like the mail on the floor in the dorm room. If there's a giant pile of mail, I don't know if the ones left on the floor are for me until I've actually looked at every single one of them. This is like the big pile of mail. You've got to look at every single thing until you can be sure that um, what you want is there or isn't there, right? If, it, if, if you pick it up before you get there, then you, you're done. But if you wanted to look to see if there's anything there for you left on the floor, you have to go through every single one, okay? So this is um, an, an analogy for that. Now let's quickly step through this animation here. We're gonna add an orange. First of all, we've got to check to see if orange is in there. We wanna add a banana. We've got to check to see if a banana is in there. We wanna add, um, now we wanna add an orange to, Okay, we've got to check here, and, and oh, orange is already there, so we don't add anything. Want to add an apricot, we check through, and it's not in there, so we add it on the end. Um, same for peach, mango, and so I'll just zoom through this stuff. But you can see we can add these things in. But the point is, to check for something, we have to walk through the list to find the thing we want. 
And um, if I want to check the, if it contains orange, well, I have to go through the list until I get to orange, right? And if I want to find if it contains mango, well, this is really time consuming, right? It's, this is going to get really tedious and boring. Okay, you've got to go through the list and, and we get to mango. And then, like if I want to look for fig, I've got to go all through this big, long, silly list. And eventually I get to the end of like, oh, there was nothing in there. So therefore, fig is not in my set. All right, so that's all I wanted to show you with that. I'm going to give you a mini quiz and we're going to go and um, uh, move on to the next section in a moment. Okay. All right, hopefully everyone got that. Any questions, Leo, on, on, the, on the sets? Um, no. Okay, great. Okay, great. All right, so that was all about um, sets. Now we're going to move to hash tables and we're going to use a hash table to implement a set, okay? So we talked about a set. Hopefully everyone understands that yes, we can implement a set using a linked list just like we can do the mail by t tossing all the 256 letters on the floor and let everyone find their own. Terrible idea, but it will work, okay? And, we're, um, and the same is true with the linked list. Bad idea, but it, 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 it's okay, it's correct. It's just not a great way to do it. Okay, so um, now let's talk about hash tables. A hash table stores key value pairs, just like a map, okay? Using a hash function to map a key into a table. Again, in the example of the dorm room, the, um, in, the, in the mail, in the, in the dormitory, the hash function was a thing that took the first letter of my last name, and then it went from Blackburn to the thing B, the thing with the label B on it, and that's how it found it, okay? So it was a hash function which goes from last name to a particular place. The key challenges are, how do we deal with hash collisions? Oh, that sounds really bad, right? A hash collision, bang. What does that mean? All that means is multiple things land in the same place. Now, Blackburn, Brown, and uh, Black are all gonna land in the same box, right? Because they all have the function that I just described, which takes the first letter of the last name, is gonna map all of them into the same pl place, right? So Brown, Black, Blackburn, and so forth. They're all gonna go to the same, same place. Um, how do we deal with that? Well, it's not a, not, a, not a drama, we just put all of them in the same pigeonhole, and all that means is those people who had collisions, meaning everyone whose name started with B, will have to go through and check to see if any of the things in there are theirs, because they don't know if they're theirs or anyone else whose name starts with B. So if you happen to be the only person in the hall whose last name starts with Z, then great, um, you, you, you probably know that uh, everything in there is yours, right? But for most people, when they go to their, their hole, they have to go and search through there because there could have been collisions. Multiple people's names go to the same pigeonhole. How do you deal with load? Um, well, load means that if you had a really bad hash, um, uh, then lots of things will end up in the same pigeonholes. Now, if you think about the hash that we had in our hall, the problem with that is that actually there were some pigeonholes that were not highly populated, right? Like, I guess, Q. There, well, even that, you see, it depends on the dem demographics of your student group. If you've got a, a lot of people who come from mainland China, for example, Q, X, and Z are actually going to be really common. But if, they're, if they're ba their family heritage was um, English, then Q, X, and Z are actually really rare. But you don't want everyone's names ending up in the same pigeonhole, otherwise you're defeating the purpose of it, right? So you really want to distribute the load as much as you can, right? And this goes back to this thing of um, this, this thing of making the thing as even as you possibly can. I just remembered I've got to show you in a moment a demo of this. We're going to do that in just a few seconds. So um, there are two broad approaches. One is what we call separate chaining. Um, Whoa, I just forgot. I forgot to go through a demo. I'm going to go through this now. I just totally forgot. This is back here. I had something to show you, some code, some very cool code to show you back from the unit before this, back here. Goodness, hashing applications. What I want you to do, um, is that where we, we had it? I think it is. Yes, it is. So um, what I'm going to do now is demonstrate those ideas. So we're going back now to C, uh, unit C3, okay? So sorry, sorry for doing stuff out of order. I just completely forgot about it. What I've got here is a, um, a very silly, uh, at the moment, okay, so what I've got here is I've written some stuff ahead of time which will take hash functions and map things into buckets and then draw them on the screen, okay? It's gonna map things into buckets and draw them on the screen. Now, um, we've got 20 buckets, and um, what I've got is some strings, and for the strings, I've got family names of people in the class, and if you go here, you can see family names given names, 
and university IDs, and we've also got a dictionary of English words, okay? So what we're gonna do is for strings, we're gonna take all the family names and put them into buckets according to whatever hash function you guys come up with. And we're gonna do the same for the given names and then for the dictionary. What I want you to start thinking about now, and you can um, start writing this in the chat, is what are gonna be good hash functions from, in the first case, integers, and the second case, strings. So we're gonna actually code it up live in the class. So I want you to suggest them and have Leo tell me what they are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you to suggest hash functions and we're gonna actually live code it and see how good your hash functions are, okay? So let's just do this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use um, everyone's UIDs as um, the set for our integer hash. And we're gonna use um, strings as the, um, uh, both the given names, family names, and dictionary as the uh, sets for the, uh, for the strings. So let's just start off with the integers first. I'll just comment this out. I'll run this program here, and it's very, very simple. Um, yep. We got one from Joshua. Okay, just, so just a second. Just, just hang on a sec. Uh, hang, on. 20. hang on a sec, Leo. I'll just do this first. <clears throat> All right, so I'm just waiting for this thing to run. It's still building. Okay, there we go. So um, what that's done, if you can see that, let, let me just go back to the code there. Hopefully everyone saw what happened here. Our hash function is here. It's written as a lambda, which takes two arguments. One is the key, which is an integer. The other one is a number of buckets. And the function we've got here is a very silly function. It's a function that always returns zero. Okay, so this is our starting function. It's a hash function, which takes, um, uh, the key and the buckets, that is, the, the, um, it takes a key, which is someone's UID, and then the number of buckets, which is going to be 20 for all of our examples, okay? And then it's going to return a value, and in this case, it's always returning the same value. What that means is everyone's going to the same bucket, which is the terrible hash. And if we go back and look at it, where was it? It was here. Whoops. Um, run it again, or it's still running. It's just, hang on, it just got, um, the window got hidden up. But if you go and look at what happened there, here it comes. Okay, so what I've done is I've drawn in gray the average, and then what's going on here is everything's falling into bucket zero. So all the UIDs in the class are all landing in bucket zero. Can you see that? So all the UIDs are in bucket zero. This is a terrible hash. What we really want to see is all the buckets be equal. Okay, so what I'm going to ask Leo to do in a moment is to tell me what suggestions you all have for hashing the UIDs, integers, into 20 buckets. Um, and I think we can start coding that up now. So let's just do that. Have you got any suggestions there, Leo, for the integer hash? Um, yeah, I think Joshua just gave us a suggestion that we should take more 20. Um, uh, in, 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 integer remainder? Three. Integer remainder of the number of buckets? Is that what the suggestion was? Yeah. Okay, so let's do that. So that's the key, and that's integer remainder and then we'll say buckets. Okay, remember, it's integer remainder, not mod, everyone. This is actually really important, and, and it's gonna slap you in the face in a few minutes, actually, if you, do, if you, if you get this wrong, in, in an interesting way. So we, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one for you to discover in a few minutes, or we'll discover it together, together in a few minutes if we get it wrong. Okay, so that was a suggestion. Let's just change the color here to um, lime green. Oops. Lime green, okay. So the, so now we've got two functions. One is the really silly one, and one is the one that Joshua just suggested. And, oh, I forgot to quit it. And let's quit that and go here, run it again. And now you'll see the really silly one where everything went to bucket zero, and you'll see the one that Joshua suggested where, where there we go. Okay, so here's the bad one over here on the left, and here is um, the one that Joshua just suggested. And you can see here, it's pretty good, right? This, a couple here where they got more than their fair share and a couple here that got less than their fair share, but most of them got pretty much the same. And this is exactly what our basketball thing would end up doing because that's exactly the function I suggest for our basketball team. And you can see here there would be a couple of teams that were understaffed and a couple of teams that had too many players, but on the whole it was pretty close to being right. All right, so we've distributed the class here into 20 buckets based on the UID by taking integer remainder of the uh, UID, all right? So that's great. Now, what about, what about strings? Has anyone got suggestions for how we hash the strings? Now, first of all, demo the really silly one, which takes, it's gonna take 
three different sets. And this is interesting because the sets have different properties. The first one is everyone in the class is given names. Actually, it's not this year's class, it's a previous year's class. The given names, the family names, and um, the dictionary, English words, right? And so um, let's see how these ones look um, when you use the silly function. Here, we've just got the silly function in there. And then once this comes up, I'm gonna ask Leah to tell me what's, what you guys have suggested uh, by way of functions. Okay, so these all look completely silly. Um, there they are, they're all coming up as, um, like that. And what's happened in every case, we've said, whatever the string is, the answer is zero, which is silly, right? So they've all ended up in bucket zero. All right, and so now what we're gonna do is we're going to um, uh, try something else. Uh, what, what have we got there, Leah? Um, we got a different one from Aiden and Cheng Hao. They say oh, we should sum some of the hex values and then do the integer remainder. We should sum up the values of the of the things. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, well, we let's choose. before we do that. Well, before we do that one, why don't we do something else? Why don't we do? I mean, that, that's a great suggestion. But okay, let's do something else. Let's do the one I suggested, the one that we have at the residential hall that I was at. Okay. So remember that that was the residential hall said take the first letter. Okay. But the first letter there's twenty of them. So let's just take the integer remainder of the first letter of the word. Everyone follow that. So let's just return key. Key dot char at zero. So you get the first character and then that could be, that's actually gonna come out as an ASCII code like 65 or whatever. We have to convert it into the number of buckets we want and the buckets are numbered zero through 19 in this case. Well, it could be anything. I've written the code nice and generally so we don't know how many buckets there are, which is good. And we'll just say buckets like that. Oops, keyboard issue, buckets. Okay, um, like that. Run this, and now you'll see how good or bad, when you look at the last name one, that's basically exactly what my residential hall had, okay? And you can see also how it applies to the English words and also to first names. So let's have a look here. Okay, there's the dictionary, not too bad, not great. Um, family names and given names. So family names, that this is what you'd get if you'd um, my residential hall, look at that. None of them fell in the last bucket. I'm not sure what the last bucket was. This is um, integer remainder 20 of the ASCII value of the thing, but turns out no one, or looks like no one, had that particular character. So there's one character in the alphabet, at least, that no one had that in their last name. That's interesting, right? And then um, you'll see that there are other ones that are pretty popular. This one here, this one here, and this one here. A lot of names fell into those buckets there. Okay, so everyone understanding what's happening here? This code, let's go back to the code here. This code is taking the first character of the word, which is either a given name, a family name, or a dictionary word, taking the first character, taking it to ASCII code, which is like 65, 66, 67, or whatever, then dividing by 10, uh, sorry, dividing by the number of buckets, and taking the integer remainder there. So that'll place it into 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 19. That's what that's doing. And you can see there, it wasn't too bad, but it wasn't great. Now let's go to the suggestion that you just read out before, Leo. What was that suggestion? Was it the, um, some of the, the some, characters. Some of the characters, yeah. Okay, so we can do that. We can, to do that, we're gonna have to write a loop, right? So let's just do that. Um, <clears throat> oops, goodness. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're going to um, say um, int rtn equals zero, and then what we'll do is do for um, <clears throat> um, r, uh, c in, um, oh, i equals zero. I'll just write this explicitly. I'm just, oh, int i. I was wondering why it's saying, doing it in red, okay. Um, I is less than, um, I is less than um, key, oh goodness, key dot um, length. All right, we're gonna go through all the letters in here and we're gonna say I plus plus, plus plus, oh goodness, plus plus, my fingers are in the wrong place here. Strange keyboard. Okay, RTN plus equals the char at uh, sorry, e equals key dot char at i. Okay, so we're going to go through each of the letters in the key. The key is a string in this case, right? So we're going to go through each of the letters in the key and um, we're going to um, add the character number we get into the return value 
And then finally, what we're gonna do is, is take the integer remainder. That was the suggestion, right, Leo? Um, RTN. Um, yes. Uh, re return integer remainder with the number of buckets, like that. Okay, there it is. Now what we'll do is um, run this one, and let's see how it goes compared to the pink one, okay? So this one comes up as orange. Let's see how it goes. <clears throat> Ooh, look at that, folks. Very nice. Okay, so you can compare now the, um, the results there. The pink is when we just take the first character, and the orange is when we sum up the characters and then take the integer remainder. And you can see it does a beautiful job of the dictionary. It does a not too bad one with the family names and the given names, and certainly a lot better than the pink one, which is just taking the first character. Does anyone know, can anyone suggest to Leo right now, why is the dictionary so much better than the names? Anyone have a suggestion as to why the dictionary is so much more even than the names are? Any suggestions on that? Okay, but this is an example of a good hash function. This is really nice, okay? That's a really nice hash function. This is an okay hash function. All right, and this is a bad one. Well, it's, it's, it's not great. A not, let's just call this one a not great hash function, the pink one. Okay, and let's go back and see what they were while I wait for an answer on that one. So here the pink one is like that, and then the orange one is where we add up all of the characters in the string and then take the integer remainder of the sum of the characters in um, the string. Yep. We, we got um, one suggestion from Georgia. He said, um, they said, uh, dictionary has longer words and, and hence it evens out more. And also got a response from other students saying lots of same name and longer probability distribution in dictionaries. That's a great, great answer. Um, so people say that, um, someone said there are bigger words in the dictionary. Some people said that there are lots of repeated names in the, in the, um, in the set of names, that's true. Particularly for last name, not so much for the first name, the, um, I think. Um, but what's really interesting, and there's another factor which is actually really, really important, really basic. Law of la large numbers. The dictionary's got like 30,000 things in it, and the class has only got 300 or 400 or whatever, however many were in, in the class that year, okay? So the class is much, 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 much smaller. And with this sort of thing, it's, there's a randomness to it. And if you do a random thing over a, t a toss of a coin, so there's two states, it's either gonna be all or nothing. And, and as the numbers grow and grow and grow, it becomes smoother and smoother and smoother. So your dictionary will tend to be smoother simply by the law of large numbers. But the other points that people made are, are, are good ones as well. Um, but I think the dominant one is the law of large numbers. Now there's one more way we can hash this that you've all forgotten and no one's mentioned yet. Maybe, maybe Leo's got it sitting there. Maybe someone has suggested it. Leo, is any other suggestions for how to hash this? Because something important that folks seem to have forgotten. There's one other really good way to do it. Anything there, Leo? Oops. Um, didn't see any... Okay. Um, wait, and hang on. Stanley said um, we need a regression to the mean. Right. Yeah, but that, I'm looking for a function. Regression to the mean, that, 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 that tells you what, that's, that's like the law, law of large numbers. What about um, a better function for this? There's a much better function which I've told you about that, uh, that, um, that we, in the lecture. Yeah, we got this from Michael who says, he said, uh, they say hash code. Ah, very good. So Michael says, let's put the hash code in here. Okay, let's do that. So we'll just do this, okay? Key dot hash code, and then we'll take the integer remainder of the number of buckets, right? And let's see what happens. Okay, let's run this, kill off the last run, and see what happens. So this should be really nice and even, right? What happened? It didn't work. Why didn't it work? Okay, I knew it wasn't gonna work. Ooh, that's ugly. Okay, it shouldn't have crashed quite like that, but there's, there's a very simple why, reason why it didn't work. It died in an ugly way. This is why it didn't work here, folks. Why did it give an index? Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this piece of code? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for anyone. Leo, did anyone suggest what, what I did wrong in this piece of code here? There's something pretty important. And there's a clue oh, to everyone. Oh, yeah. Integer remainder is a very important thing. I stressed it way back up there. I said, oh if, yeah, we, we got it, one from Stanley. He said, um, integer remainder and, mod, and, the, and modular arithmetic is so the difference between. Yeah, that's r exactly right. There's a big difference between mod, mod and integer remainder. Integer remainder can give a negative value. 
modulo can't, okay? And we're actually doing integer remainder here. And this is why I said to you before that actually the difference does matter. I'm not just being a pedant here. And in this case, I said it would slap you in the face. Well, it just slapped us in the face with this big, ugly error message, right? So what we need to do here is take the absolute value, okay? So we take math.abs. So take the absolute value because what because the hash code can be negative. It's a 32-bit integer. So the hash code can come back as a negative number. And if you take the integer remainder of a negative number, you can get a negative remainder, okay? So we need to take the absolute value. And now we do this, and let's see what happens. <clears throat> all right and we get something that looks pretty good all right so that's the purple one um, it's actually not much better than or not much different to the orange one which is when we summed up all the characters but it's actually um, faster believe it or not well it, it, it's almost certainly faster because the way they implement hash code is very 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 efficient and it doesn't depend on the length of the string it just they can look it up like that so hash code is a much faster way to do it and it's giving a pretty good distribution arguably on the family names this one is better which is interesting but you can see on the dictionary with the large numbers uh, you know th there's no point in using this this here you could use this here just as well um, but uh, there you go, folks. So I want to remind you that hash code is a very important hash function. And rather than go and write your own like this here, which could behave really badly under cer certain circumstances, it's often a very good idea to start with hash code and just assume that's gonna be good. You can evaluate and check whether it is in fact good. But um, that was the demo I forgot to give you for um, unit C3. Let's flip back to our slides now and go back to where we were all the way here in Sorry, we've been through all this. Now we're on to hash tables. And um, I was just explaining this to you. Um, and I was saying there are two different approaches to implement. I had, yeah, I had not done that. So, okay. Uh, the two different approaches to building a hash table. So now we're talking about a hash table, right? Okay, that, that demo was just reminding you about hash functions. Now we're talking about hash tables, okay? And a hash table is a data structure that is built using a hash function. You can see it in the first sentence on the slide there, using a hash function, right? The hash function is what we just did a moment ago, okay? Those lambdas were hash functions. Okay, um, <clears throat> so we have to deal with hash collisions, that's where multiple things go into one bucket, and dealing with load. How to make the, how big do we make the table? And the question is, how big do we make the table? In that example there, the table is always the same size. It's always size 20 in those examples, right? Um, but you need to know how to size your hash table. And this is actually a really tricky question. Um, and um, you don't want to make it too big. If you make it really, really big, what happens? Well, you have very few collisions because it's like the dining hall where you had 250 pigeonholes, okay? That, if you had it big enough, then no two students would share the same pigeonhole, which is awesome. But what happens? Well, you, you fill the dining hall up with pigeonholes and it's no longer a dining hall. It's like a giant mail room, okay? So there's a trade-off there. It doesn't come for free. There's a cost associated with building all these pigeonholes, okay? So, so yes, it gives you a better result, but um, it also comes at a real cost. So th there's a real challenge here. How do we size it right? The answer to that is tricky, and it often, well, it always depends on the load. What is it you're running, you do using this hash table for? Are you using this hash table to deal with um, eight possible varieties of fruit? If you're dealing with eight possible varieties of fruit, that's a totally different problem to dealing with something with the Australian census or the Chinese census or something like that where you've got a billion people, right? If you're dealing, dealing with something like that, then you want to do things very differently to if you're dealing with eight pieces of fruit, okay? So um, you, the, the national census or uh, university IDs or something like that is going to be dealt with differently to something tiny like the pieces of fruit in a bowl. So there are two broad approaches. One is called separate chaining. Um, where the hash table entries are lists, and um, so each entry in the hash table points to a list. Another one is what we call open addressing, and the hash table entries are the key value pairs, okay? And we resolve the collisions in open addressing by probing. So what that means is, if we've got a big table here, each, one, each entry in the table is actually a, a key value pair, it means that if we jump to this one here with our, with our, with our key, it takes us to here, if that one there, um, is a collision, that is, we've gone to a thing, there's already something there and it's not our key, then we just walk down the table until we find an empty slot, okay? We're not going to cover open addressing in any further detail in today's class, or in this course at all, in fact. 
we're just going to deal with what we call separate chaining. Okay, separate chaining is what we're going to focus on here, but I did want to mention that there's another very standard way of doing hashing, which we call open addressing. Okay, and you can read about these more if you're interested. But separate chaining is what we're going to do in, in our class. Okay. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Question from Brad. Um, they asked, is a rainbow table example of a hash table, or are these slightly different concepts? What was the question? What type of table? Um, uh, is is a rainbow table a example of a hash table? I don't know what I don't know what they're referring to. I can do a Google Google search, but I I don't know. I don't, I like I can't even make out the word rainbow. Yeah. So the rainbow table. Rainbow or ra how spelled how? Um, it's the rain R A I N B O W. Oh, I don't know what a rainbow table is. That's probably a very specific data structure. A hash table is one of the most important basic data structures um, that we have in computer science. Rainbow table, I don't know. Rainbow, I'm just going to look it up right now. Oh, it's a very specific thing for um, cryptographic hash functions. So you, you, um, okay, so you, okay. <laughs> All right, for cracking password hashes, great. Okay, so it's a specific application of hashing used for, for um, cracking um, password hashes. And basically what you're doing is you're calculating a whole lot of hashes ahead of time and putting them in a table. Yeah, that's an application of hashing, it's not a hash table, all right? Um, a hash table is used for storing key value pairs. Well, maybe it is a hash table, but it's, it's very, very specific, okay? So, um, uh, um, it's not a general purpose data structure. The point about a hash table, it is a general purpose data structure. It takes a key and a value. That value could be any type you want. The key can be any type you want. The rainbow table is used for storing one thing that's cryptographic hashes, um, hash functions. So that's something totally different. So a hash table is a general purpose computer science data structure, which we use for, for mapping from a key to a value. Now, what we're gonna be doing in this class is sets. So sets, in that case, we're just gonna say if something exists, or doesn't exist. And the hash table, what we're gonna do is map to an entry in the hash table, and then we're gonna have a list. And if the item we want is in the list, then it's in the set. If it's not in the list, it's not in the set. So let's have a look here. Remember we had that set of fruit. Remember how we put them in the linked list before? Now what we're gonna do is map them into a hash table. And we're gonna use a hash table to test the existence of that piece of that element in the set. So here we go. So it's gonna end up looking like this. All right, so look on the left there, what you see is four buckets. We've got a, a very simple, this is a very tiny example with just 10 pieces, of, 10 elements in the set and just four buckets. So there are four buckets there. These buckets are really simple. The hash func function is totally trivial. What the function is doing is saying if the letter of the first letter of the name of the element is between A and F, then go in the first bucket, G to M, second bucket, N to T, third bucket, U to Z, last bucket. Okay, so it's just splitting the alphabet four ways and saying depending on where it lies in the alphabet, hashed there, then put a linked list in there. Remember, you can store a set in a linked list and that's exactly what's going on here. So now what we basically have is four subsets, okay? And so when we want to check to see if something's in our set, we say, okay, where does it hash to? Look to that element in the hash table and then see if it's in the set that's associated with that element, okay? Because it cannot be anywhere else because you know banana cannot be in any of the three lower sets. It cannot be because it must be in the first one because the letter B hashes into the first one, okay? So whenever anyone inserts a banana into this data structure here, it must go to the first one because the letter B maps to that first thing, all right? So this is a way of splitting the load. This is just like, this is exactly like the pigeonholes in the mailbox example. Instead of having everything just spread out in one big thing, you've got to search through every single item. Here what we have now is four pigeonholes, and now I only have to search through about a quarter as much stuff. In the particular example on the screen right there, they're not evenly distributed. You'll notice that there is nothing in the bottom one because it turns out there aren't very many fruit that whose first letter starts between U and Z. And there aren't too many in the G to M one because I happen to choose not very many whose letters are in that range as well. And this is an example here. You see I've got some pretty common fruit on the screen there. Turns out the common fruit have names that are not evenly distributed in the alphabet. Not a big surprise. And so what you're seeing there is they're not well distributed amongst those four buckets. Okay, they're unevenly distributed. Now let's see how this thing works. If I want to add an apple, I look at the first letter of the word apple. It's A, that means it maps into the first cell in this hash table. 
I go to that cell there, I look at the linked list there. Is there a linked list? There is no linked list. There's no linked list. Because there's no linked list, it means there are no apples in this hash table and nothing else for that matter. Um, and then I create a linked list and add apple to it. That's what just happened there in that little animation. Let's just run that again like this. We add apple to the hash table. Now we're gonna add another fruit. We're gonna add orange, same thing. Different place because O maps into that third bucket, okay? Banana, well, there is a linked list in this case. Let's look at the linked list. Is it in the linked list? No, it's not, so add it to the end of the linked list. Pear, okay, same thing, it, but it maps to the third link, um, element in the table. So we go to that linked list, we search that linked list, we don't find any pears, so we add pear. Apricot, same deal. Um, peach and mango and plum and grape. And what you're noticing here, hopefully, is that we've still got that same searching property we saw with that giant big long linked list, but the amount of searching we do is significantly reduced, okay? And if we made more and more elements in the hash table, the searching gets less and less and less, okay? Because these lists get shorter and shorter and shorter. Just like having more mailboxes in the residential hall. And if we add cherry, we end up with that, okay? Now, you may think, oh, there's order in that. That order there is only an order in the way we've stored it in the table. The set has no notion of order. It's just, is cherry in the table or is cherry not in the table? There's no concept of cherry being last. There's no concept of apple being first. That's not such a concept for the notion of a set. It's simply, is apple in the table? Yes, it is. Is cherry in the table? Yes, it is. Now, if I wanted to add another thing like, um, uh, yeah, if I want to test to see if orange is in there, I first of all take the word orange, look at the first letter, map to the right list, and then I ask that list and say, hey, is orange in this list? And it goes down there and says, yeah, it's there. So it's in the set. Same with grape. I'll go to that, that one there and see if, and now look for fig. It maps to the first one. It's not there. There's nothing in that list. There are no figs in this set. Okay. So let's do the mini quiz now. And what we're gonna do now is go and implement this, okay? So now it's now time to implement the uh, hash set. And we're gonna do that here. And first of all, we've gone and implemented our set. Um, I've done this ahead of time for you all. So we've got a set interface here, all right? So you can, hopefully you can see the set interface. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to, um, let me see my notes here, what are we gonna do first? Oh, yeah, we're going to create two instances of this. One, just like we did before, we're going to create two empty instances. One is going to be a tree set, and the other one will be a hash set. Okay, so let's do that. So we'll say, um, uh, create new, come on, new Java class. We'll call it a tree set, like that. And we'll add it to git, and we'll say, okay, and we'll parameterize it in T, so it's generic, and it implements um, our set like that, okay? And then um, it's gonna say, hey, there's a problem here, that's because we need to implement the missing functions. Maybe, come on. Must be the abstract, or declared to implement, uh, blah, 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 add, uh, hang on. Implement the methods, there we go, that's what we want. Okay, so it's gonna add them for us. Okay, so now we've got an empty implementation of a tree set. We're just gonna do the same thing for a hash set. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna write, once I've done this, we're gonna write ourselves some tests. Okay, test-driven development. <clears throat> and we're gonna write ourselves the same thing here. We're gonna parameterize it in T for some type T, which means that it async can hold strings or integers. Implements um, set T, okay, whoops, T like that, and then it should be asking us to, there it is, implement the missing methods. Okay, there we go. So we've now got two empty implementations, one for the hash and one for the tree. Next thing we need to do is to write ourselves a test. Okay, so we're gonna create a new class here called um, Java class, we'll call it set test for testing our sets. Okay, and then what we wanna do is write a few functions here um, what do we want to test for? Um, first of all, we can write ourselves a um, boolean at the top, private uh, static um, final um, boolean um, uh, hash set. I'll use 
Oh, I forget how we did it in the other example. Uh, I, I like consistency. Let's see, what do we do here? Uh, array, okay. Hash, like that. Equals true, we'll start off with a hash. So what we're gonna do is gonna implement the test so we can test either hash ones or the list ones, okay, uh, the, 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 the tree ones, we're gonna do both. And we're gonna write tests for a few things. Um, uh, test, test, okay. And we're gonna say um, public void, add like this, okay. And now for the add test, um, we're gonna, Someone was it? Um, someone asked before about you know, on Piazza about assumptions, and I think I put it in there last week. I hope I did in the comments. Yeah, so I wrote here implicitly testing size and two string. Okay, that's what I've mentioned in the in Piazza, um, and we're going to do the same thing here. When we write this, we have to make an assumption about stuff that's already working, and what we're going to do is we're going to assume that two string and size are working. I mean, this test will be for the test for add will be implemented in terms of size and two string. Okay, so there are some things that are very hard to test for. They're most they're so basic that we just we write a test built on top of those things. So, um, so we're going to do that. We're going to say, um, oops, Okay, um, and then what we're going to do here is create ourselves a set. We'll say set um, t like that. A set of strings, right? Set of strings. We're going to make strings here. Set of strings um, s. Um, we'll call it set equals. And depending on whether hash is set to be true. Um, oh, didn't I just? Where am I? Sorry. Where did I put that? Um, Oh, sorry, I'm doing this in exactly the wrong place. I jumped. I started typing in the wrong place here. We want to put that in here. There. Okay. There, this is what I meant to, where I meant to be. We'll say um, hash. If hash is true, then we'll say new um, hash set um, else, which is what you do, write a colon, new tree set, right? Like that. Okay, so depending on whether hash is true, we're going to make our set be a true hash set or a tree set, which allows us to use the same set of tests for testing both of these things. Okay, and then what we're going to do is the first thing is an empty set should have what? It should have size zero. So let's just do that first. Make sure that's true. Assert true um, set dot size equals zero. All right, and we'll make sure this is included. Uh, what input static method? Yep. All right. Okay, so we, the empty set should have size zero, and then we're going to add some stuff. We'll say set dot add um, Alice. So we're adding the string Alice to our set, and then after that, we should be able to say that the size is equal to one, right? The size should now be equal to one, and the two string. When we get that string, we should find that um, we'll say assert equals equals. Actually, I should be using assert equals here, by the way. Equals expected is zero. Like that. That's the right way to do it. I shouldn't have say I shouldn't have written the way I did. And in, in, in the old Intel Intel in the old um, J unit encourage you to do it the way I wrote before. Okay, so we're updating all the stuff to J unit five. And that this is the better way to do it. All right. So now what we're saying is that we're we're expecting um, the size to be equal to one, and now we're also expecting um, Alice to be the string. Uh, if we turn the um, set dot two string. Oops. Sorry, my computer's lagging here. Two string. Okay. So if we get the string from the set, it should just have the string Alice. Okay. Now let's um, what we can do. Can it, uh, uh, Leah, has anyone suggested things we should test for? One no. thing, yep. No. Okay, one thing, we can, one thing we can definitely test for is duplicates, okay? I'll just write that in here as a comment. Test, test for duplicates. Okay, so we want to test for duplicates. Um, <clears throat> and so if we add Alice again, it should still be size one, it should still have the same contents, okay? So now we're going to add Bob. 
let's just do the cut and paste to save typing. I, I really want to do this quickly um, like this. Get rid of that stuff there. Then we're going to add Bob to the set. Now, I want you to think carefully about what's going to happen with this string here. <clears throat> right? Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we can't use the equals here. We've got to do something a little bit more interesting because it just won't work. Um, we need it, but because there's two different possibilities. Because sets are unordered, it could be Alice comma Bob or it could be Bob comma Alice. We do not know. Okay, both are legitimate answers because there's no ordering in a set. So it could be like this. Or, um, and so what we should say, um, cut and paste here. So we're going to do this a little bit differently because we're going to have a conjunction, sorry, a, a disjunction here, equals, right? Okay, so the string's either going to be equal to that or it's going to be equal to the opposite, right? <clears throat> It's, it's, or it's going to be equal to Bob, comma Alice, right? Um, and again, we can we can we can go and add Bob in again. And we get the same answer, right? Um, because adding Bob in again should make no difference to any of that. All right. Um, what else do we want to do? We can add in Cindy. I'm not going to go all verbose here and add all that stuff for Cindy, but um, let's just do this part. Add a third thing here, and we'll just say um, that the size should be three if we add Cindy. And if we add Cindy twice, same thing, right? Okay, so we add Cindy, and we add Cindy twice, same thing. Okay, so now we've got a test for add. Not a great test, but it's a test. The other thing that Java allows you to do is to insert null into your sets, which is really actually quite annoying, as you guys are going to discover as we go and implement this thing. But we can actually put a null as like it's an, an element in the set. So um, <clears throat> we want to be able to do that. So um, <clears throat> to do that, what we're going to do is every place I said Alice, we're just going to add null. And what should get printed out here is should be null and it treats it like an element. So yeah, there is one thing in there. It's the thing called null, right? And so we like this, null like that. And if we add Bob, we should get null and Bob and Bob and null or, or Bob and null and the same here. And all those other things should, should stay the same. Oops, I made a mistake here. That shouldn't be adding a string called null. It should be adding the actual null. All right. Um, <clears throat> and then um, next we want to do a test contains. So let's do that. Um, we'll start by copying this again just to save typing. We'll just do some manipulation on this one. Test contains. Okay. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to say... Um, <clears throat> We'll add Alice, and what we're going to do is um, we need to test that Alice is in there, right? So we test that, test that, and <clears throat> assert true. Um, Alice, oh, sorry, set dot contains Alice, All right? So if we test for Alice, it should be true. And we can say um, assert false that it doesn't contain Bob, right? Um, assert false. And you can do the same thing for Cindy as well, right? It mustn't contain Cindy at this point either, kind of obviously. And then... Um, <clears throat> The same thing is going to be true down here. And then after we've added Bob, then um, Bob will be true. So we assert true for set contains Bob. And the same thing after we add Bob again, it should also be there. And then after we add Cindy, it should, uh, we should find that Cindy is there also. Okay. And then like that. Okay, so now we've tested that. 
Then the last thing we want to test for, I think, I think all we have left is remove, um, if I'm not mistaken. So we're going to take the same thing, take our giant piece of code here and butcher it a bit more. It's a big whopping great test here. We'll say test remove. Test remove. Um, Okay, so we're going to do a test for remove, and what do I want to do? We're going to remove all the things from it, okay? Um, and then what we should do here is we should say um, set dot remove Alice Alice, um, and then we can remove the other ones too, right? They shouldn't fail. We should be able to remove Bob and Cindy. And then we should find that the size is equal to zero and the, the none of them should be in the set anymore. So we go like this, they should not be in there. Okay, so false, false, false. Okay. And then we can do the same sort of thing again. We just maybe remove Bob maybe after we've added Bob in, we'll just remove Alice, I guess. After we've added all these things in here, uh, after we've added Bob, I mean, goodness. All right, so after we've added Bob, here we'll remove Bob again. Uh, actually, let's add in, we're supposed to be testing for duplicates, so we'll add Alice twice back up here. And then um, Bob here, we're going to um, test that we've removed. We're just going to remove Alice at this stage, I think. And then what should happen is that the set should not contain Alice, it should contain Bob, but it should not contain Cindy. Okay, then if we add Bob back in and add Bob again, then it should contain all those, uh, both, both Bob and um, Alice. What did I remove? Sorry, I've removed Alice. Um, so add Alice. Alice, here we go. Like that. Okay, then at that point um, we should have um, assert true contains Alice. There it is. All right, so now we've added those things in here, and they should be. Um, I think that's probably enough <laughs> testing. All right, so we've got a ton load of tests there. Let's go and write ourselves a hash set. Okay. <clears throat> now the first thing is here's a question for you all. If I'm going to make myself a hash set, how big should I make it? It's got to have a hash table, right? If it's a hash set, you saw the picture. Let's just go back to that picture because I'm going to refer back to this thing. Okay, there it is. So how big should I make this table? In this case here, it's got four elements in the table. I want you to make suggestions on the chat about how big this table should be. Any suggestions as to how big this should be? Nope. <clears throat> Well, it's a pretty key question. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off with a, a particular number of buckets. And I, I abbreviate buckets with BKTS for buckets, and we'll say two. And um, the reason for that is having a small number makes it easy to test whether our debugging is working, all right? So just for testing, comma, make bigger later, all right? And then, <clears throat> what do we need in this? If we're going to implement this, what do we need? Okay, let's go back to here. What do we need? We need to have an array which has got all these buckets in it. And we need to count how many elements are in here. At that point, there are 10, right? There are 10 pieces of fruit. We need to know how many elements are on in there. So we'll say int elements. And what is, what's the type of each, each of these things? What's the type here? Well, it's going to be a linked list, right? So this is an array of linked lists, an array of linked lists. So we're going to use the standard Java linked list. We don't need to use our own linked list in this case. We're creating a hash set, but we're going to create it using the standard Java linked list. So what we're going to have here is linked list, linked list. Um, we don't need to use, yeah, we'll just use the Java util one. There it is. So Java util linked list um, like that. So it's an array of linked lists, and we'll call it the table, right? This is the hash table. Okay, so the table 
is, um, is that. And um, we want a constructor here. Let's create, make a constructor um, public hash set um, hash set. And um, in the constructor, we'll, we'll allocate the table. The moment the table has nothing in it, so we'll allocate the table. How? What we'll do? We'll create an array of objects. It has to be correct. Um, uh, sorry, it's just a, uh, sorry. It's an array of linked list, right? Of course. Um, so it's going to be an array of linked list. We'll say uh, table equals equals new linked list um, default buckets. Okay. So we've created a table with default buckets number of linked lists in it. Okay. Now each of those linked lists is going to be null at the moment because the table's got null entries in it. But it's a table of size linked list, which is uh, of default buckets, which is two. All right, so now the next thing we need is a hash function. What should we use as a hash function? Can anyone suggest to Leo what we should use as a hash function? We need a hash function to take the elements, in this case it's fruit, and map them into here. We don't know what the type is. All we know is there's a type T. So we can't use something that's specific to strings. That won't work. We can't use something that's specific to integers. That won't work. It's got to be a general hash function that will take us into the right bucket number according to something. So given an object, it's going to give us take us into a, to a bucket number. So I want you to suggest that private int um, <clears throat> hash, and it's going to take an element of type T, and it's going to do something. What's it going to return? Any suggestion there, Leo? Well, one thing is we can hash the element null. That's one possibility. We're going to do a special case for that one. Okay. So null. If the element is null. Um, um. Yep. Yeah, we, we got some from um, students here. They suggest you use the hash code function and do an integer remainder to mod two, or someone also suggests mod bucket number. Yep, and we'll and don't we'll, we'll need to take the absolute value. Remember, because the, the the suggestion if you can't hear Leo's voice, the suggestion there is that we use the hash code. That's exactly what I was looking for. But don't forget that we need to um, to uh, if. Uh, to, to take the absolute value of the hash code, right? So we're going to say math.abs of the hash code, element, element dot hash code. Okay, notice I did this thing first because they can ask us to put a null into the table. And if we tried to take the hash code of null, it would give us a null pointer exception. So I first of all tested to see if the element was null, and I've just returned it an arbitrary value. I've just said zero here because there's always at least one bucket in the table. So it said zero. It doesn't really matter. It's only one element in the set. So now I said, otherwise, take the absolute value of the hash code and then take the integer remainder of that with the number of buckets. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and actually, what more correctly, what we should do here is table.length because in theory, someone could grow the table. We're not going to do that in our class, but in theory, someone could grow the table. So it's probably always a good idea to actually use the table length to do the hashing. All right. Now, let's try and add something. Okay. So what are we going to do when we add something? Um, so first of all, um, what we can do is we need to hash it, find out which bucket it goes into, right? So we say int bucket, which bucket should this thing go into? Equals um, hash of the element. Okay. So now we have a bucket. Now what we need to do is look at that bucket and see if there's a linked list already there. So we'll say uh, linked list um, e, e uh, ll, we'll call it ll, equals, uh, don't need that, L ll um, equals, sorry, it's of type t, the whole thing's parameterized in t, I don't know why I wrote e. Maybe it's because IntelliJ just prompted me for that. Okay, so it, the type is T, so it's a linked list of type T, and we're going to call it LL, and that's going to be equal to whatever is in the table at bucket number BKT, bucket. Okay, that could be null, remember? If it's null, which is how things are going to start out, remember when start out there's nothing in there, we'll say if LL equals null, then we simply create one first. Okay, so then we'll say, okay, then we'll say uh, table brackets BKT equals new linked list. Okay, so we create a new linked list and we have to set LL, LA equals uh, table, table BKT. Okay, so now we have ourselves a linked list one way or another. <clears throat> and then what we need to do is to see if the linked list that we have contains the thing we're looking for. Because if it does, 
then there's nothing to do. There's no adding to be done. If it doesn't, then we can go and add it. So we say if um, ll.contains um, the, the thing we're looking for, element, then we can just return. Return, well, perhaps a slightly more graceful way to write, write it to say if it doesn't contain the thing we're looking for, then we can add it. We we'll say ll.add the element, oops, element, and, right, Steve, yep. A question from Michael, he is asking, uh, why do we need to call absolute on elements of hash code? Isn't the hash code already positive? No, that, that was the lesson from the previous one. The hash code is not positive, it's an integer. It returns an int, okay? Hash code returns an int, uh, which can be negative, okay? So we don't know if it's positive or negative. That's why we must always return the hash code. That's why we ran into the error message. If you look at the video of the lecture, you go rewind, you'll find that we got slapped in the face, as I said, because that returned a negative number, and we got an error message, I think it said, uh, index was minus four. Okay, it was trying to index in the table at minus four. That's because the integer remainder of a negative number came back with a negative integer remainder, which gave us a bad index in the table. So there's a very important point. We need to take the absolute value whenever we use hash code because, well, not whenever we use it, but whenever we use it as an index, we have to take the absolute value because it can, it will return negative numbers. Okay, so it's a very important point. Um, what we can do now is size, oh, what do we return for size? We just return the number of elements, right? Um, then that's it. Um, we've now got add. Oh, we haven't done two string. Of course, we need to do two string, which is pretty important. <clears throat> so let's do that. We haven't implemented the two string method. At uh, override um, public string two string. And then what we're going to do, remember order doesn't matter in a set. So it's up to us as to what order we do it. So what we're going to do is just walk through that table and for each table walk through the list. So we'll say for um, int i equal, or bucket called bkt. For bucket equals zero to um, uh, table table dot length um, sorry I forgot what language I'm writing in. <laughs> okay um, bkt like that <clears throat> And we do, we do this here, and so that's going to go iterate through each element of the table. Then we'll say um, linked list um, of t equals ll equals um, table at the bucket, bkt, there it is. So now we've got ourselves a linked list. Now, if the linked list is empty, um, then um, if the ll is not equal to null, then we do stuff. If it's equal to null, then there's nothing to be done. Okay? If the LL is not equal to null, then um, we just go through the linked list and, um, and add it to the string. We need a string at the top here, which we'll call string dot um, RTN equals empty string. So start off with an empty string and add stuff to it, okay? If the linked list is not, is, is not null, then we'll say for, um, uh, type T E elements in the linked list for all the elements in the LL uh, do the following and then we're just going to add them on to the return RTN plus RTN plus equals um, whatever the element to string is okay so plus equals E dot to string okay like that however there's something not quite right here we need to put a comma after each element except for the last one or if you want to think of it differently we need to put a comma in front of everything except the first one so it's easy to know if we're the first one because this will be empty. So what we can do is we can say if um, RTN dot equals empty, there's no, we haven't, this is the first thing, then we um, do that. Otherwise we do, um, um, actually what we can do is if it's that, then if it's empty, we do nothing. Otherwise we do a comma in front, comma and a space. Um, okay, so what we're doing here is just saying, we've got a prefix in front of our answer. The prefix is either gonna be nothing or comma followed by a space. And if we've got no string yet, then the prefix is nothing. Otherwise, let me write this longer hand for you all so it's more obvious. String prefix equals, now I'll just cut and paste this like this. Okay, so now the prefix is either going to be empty string, nothing, or 
a comma followed by a space, and then what we're going to do is return the prefix followed by e.toString. Okay? And we're adding all those things up, and at the end of it, we return the string, or return RTN. Okay, we now have a two string. Now, in theory, we should be able to run our test. Let's have a look. Uh, run set test. <clears throat> and we've got add to work. Great. But we haven't got add null to work. We should find out what's going on with add null. Okay. So, um, Okay, notice this first, add, test add work, that's terrific. It means we've successfully got normal add working, but we've also got a separate one which allows us to add null into the set, which is actually legal in Java, but it went wrong, and it says because E is null, what's this all about? Let's have a look here. Oh, all right, this is, this is not too hard to understand. What it says is that E is null at this line of code here. Um, e is coming from, oh, that's the elements in the linked list. E is an element in the linked list, okay? Um, now, if E is null, it means that the linked list delivered us a null entry, which is legal in Java. So what we need to do is to turn that into the letters N-U-L-L, -L, okay? So now what we need to say is, um, if, if um, E um, is equal to null, then return N-U-L-L, then add N-U-L-L, -L, otherwise E dot to string, okay? So if the element stored in the linked list was actually null, then hand back the letters N-U-L-L. -L. Otherwise, turn that element into a string and hand that back. Now let's see what happens. <clears throat> Fantastic, we've got add working and we've got add null. So we can now add nulls to our set and it returns the right value for the test that we wrote, okay? So when I say it's working again, it's not that it's working, it's the passing our very simplistic test. Okay, so now let's do a, uh, let's do contains, uh, which should be easy enough to do. So we can actually pinch a bunch of code from here. It's actually very similar to add. Let's just grab this code here, dump it into here, and we're gonna return a Boolean here. Okay, so first of all, we're gonna say, take the element, find its hash code, great. Then we're gonna create a linked list. Uh, we're gonna grab a linked list from the table. Now, if the linked list is null, then we can return false straight away, okay? Because that means whatever we're looking for was not here. Return um, false, because if there's no linked list there, it means no one ever tried to enter this thing in. Okay, so we're good to go, if the linked list was null. Otherwise, then if the LL contains the element, then add, um, the, no, we don't want to add it. If it contains it, then we return true. Okay, so now we just say, okay, all right, let me back up here. We went to the table, we found the bucket, we went to the table, we got an LL back. If there was no LL there at all, then we return false. Otherwise, we return whether or not the linked list contains the element. So we say, return LL.contains element. It's all we need to know, know now is, is the, is the element in the linked list? That's all we need to know for the contains. Let's see if that's good. And then after that, if that works, we all have to do is do the remove and we're done with this. Okay, contains works, great. So now what we're gonna do is again, I'm gonna do some pinching here. We'll just pinch this code just to save time. I'm gonna cut and paste this code here. Okay, the first part's the same. Someone wants to remove this element, okay? First of all, hash into the table using that element. Get a hash code, find out which bucket it's, it's in, okay? Let's just, for those of you who have lost, lost me here, uh, you know, are, are lost, look here. We're gonna, if we wanna remove banana, we'd take banana, we'd find its hash code, we'd find out that it's in this one, we'd find the linked list in here. Then we'd say to the linked list, hey, take banana out of your linked list, okay? So, we're gonna do that, we're gonna say, if the linked list is null, then someone's trying to remove something that doesn't exist. So we only wanna deal with the case when it's not null, okay? Otherwise, there's nothing to be done, right? So if we got back a non-null linked list, then there's work to be done. And what, what work is there? First of all, check if the element we're interested in is actually in that linked list, right? Because it could have been, the person could have been asking for fig. They might have said remove fig. So we get this down here, there's a non-null linked list there, we wanna remove fig but fig's not in there anyway, so we can't remove it, okay? So we first need to check if fig is actually in there. So let's do that first, if the thing is actually in there. So we say, if um, ll.contains, 
um, the thing we're looking for, which is the element, then what, we'll, what we're going to do is two different things. First of all, we're going to ask the linked list to remove it, ll.remove um, the element, and we can reduce the number of elements in the whole, the, the, the counter of elements, minus, minus. Otherwise, there's nothing to be done because um, otherwise uh, it wasn't in the table. There's no, no work to be done. So let's just run this and see how we went. Oop, didn't quite work. What have I done wrong here? Um, okay, something didn't work. Test remove, set test. Okay, it says here, what have we done here? Oh, that's not right. Okay, the test is broken. Let's have a look here. It says we've put Alice in Bob. They're both in there and Cindy isn't. So we've got a set with Alice, Bob and Cindy and then we've removed Alice. So what's left in the set? Well, it should be size one, right? Because it means Bob must be in the set. So that's an error in the test, okay? Very important to consider the possibility your test is broken. Okay, still more problems. Again, it's possible it's in the test. Let's have a look here. What's happened here? Um, so let's have a look here. We've got a set here. We've got Bob in the set. We've still got Bob in the set. We've added Alice. And we've somehow or other said that Bob shouldn't be in the set. Of course, Bob should still be in the set because we haven't removed Bob. So that's also a mistake in the test. Okay, just in case you, you're lost there. We've said here that Bob is in the set because we added Bob up here, right? We added Bob right up here and we never took Bob out. Bob's still in the set, Bob's still in the set. And then um, here, uh, Bob's still in the set, but we, our test said it, Bob shouldn't be in there, which is a mistake, right? So now let's um, <clears throat> see how we go. Okay, fantastic. We passed all the tests. Please bear in mind the possibility that there's further mistakes down here and that there's also mistakes in, in our implementation. This is always a possibility when you're writing tests that your test has a mistake and you've done the same test in your, in your code. That's why it's important to have multiple tests and ideally written by different people. All right, with that, we're done with um, A04. We're still a little behind, actually. I wanted to get through A05, and I want to get through trees. I'm going to introduce you to this because we've still got some time. We'll, we'll get started on trees right now. Abstract data types, trees. Okay, so we're looking at sets, and we're looking at different ways of implementing sets. One way to implement a set um, was with a hash table, which we just did. You just learned all about hash tables, one of the most important data structures in computer science. You just learned about hash tables. Now we're going to learn about another important um, data type, which is called a tree. Now, um, we're going to specifically look at binary search trees, which are called BSTs, binary search trees here. And um, <clears throat> the tree as abstract data type can corresponds an ordered tree in mathematics. That's what they call it in mathematics is an ordered tree. A tree is defined recursively in terms of node. A tree is a node. A node contains a value and a list of trees. Okay, no node is duplicated. In this example here, this is a node. It is a tree. It has um, possibly value. You can't see the value on the slide, but there may be a value there. And it's got two um, subtrees, okay? So it's got a list of trees. There are two for this one here. This one here has three, okay? And there is no duplication of nodes. It means that if there's values on these, that the, the, they must be different. Okay, a binary search tree is a tree which has the following additional properties. Each node has at most two subtrees. How many can it have then? Well, it can have zero, it can have one, and it can have two. That's what at most means, okay? And this is important. I know it's pedantic, but we're, we're pedantic pedantic when we're computer scientists, okay? So each node can have at most two subtrees. So it can have zero subtrees, it can have one subtree, or it can have two subtrees. Nodes may contain key value pairs or just keys. In, in our case, we're gonna do keys. Later on, we're gonna build maps. And when we build maps, they're gonna have a key value pair in there. Keys are ordered within the tree. So the left subtree only corresponds to keys that are less than the node's key. And the right subtree only contains keys that are greater than the node's key. This will all become clear in a minute. I'm going to give you some examples. All right. So look, we're going to take a set again. And instead of putting it into a linked list, and, uh, or instead of, oh, by the way, put in the chat if you can see any relationship between a linked list and a tree. Sorry, specifically, what's the relationship between a linked list and a binary tree? 
a binary search tree. I defined a binary search tree a minute ago. Each node can have um, at most two um, subtrees. What's the relationship between a linked list and a binary tree? Now, while you go and answer that, let me continue the lecture. Let's take our set here and put them in a tree. Here you have a tree, okay? Notice that it is a binary search tree, which means that every node has a value in there. You can see the values hanging off, that's the black arrow. And they have, at most, two trees, okay? So um, notice that the one with apple has one tree, the one with orange has two trees, a left and a right. And grape, apricot, cherry, oh sorry, grape, apricot, peach and plum. Hey Steve, yep. uh, we got response from student. I think the list is just one branching factor tree. So, and another, Joshua also said, I think the list has each of the elements linked to each other, just like the tree. Okay, not, they're not quite answering the question. What's the relationship between a binary search tree and a linked list? People are saying that they're similar. There's actually a stronger answer than that. Let me continue with this. Um, let me continue with what I was saying here, and I want you to see if you can get, come up with a stronger statement than what I just heard. Um, all right, so what I was saying was that the apricot, the grape, the peach, and the plum have no leaves. Okay, they have no subtrees. The pear has two subtrees, the orange has two subtrees, the banana has two subtrees. The cherry, the mango, and the apple all have one subtree. Okay, so it's a binary search tree. And notice that they're ordered, so they're ordered alphabetically. So everything which has a higher um, alphabetical, lexicographical ordering than the value in the node is on the right, and everything which has a lower lexicographical ordering is on the left. So when you get to apple, if anything has a lower lexicographical ordering, it is on the left. None of the fruit, as it happens, are to the left of the apple. Why? Because none in our, in our bowl of fruit happen to have a lower lexicographical ordering. There's nothing lower than A in our set of fruit. Orange, on the other hand, has about half the things on its left and about half on the right. Uh, okay, it's got uh, five on the, on, the, on the left and uh, three on the right. And that's because banana, apricot, mango, cherry, and grape are all lower than orange lexicographically, whereas pear, peach, and plum are all higher than orange lexicographically. Obviously, if you think about it, the shape of this tree depends on the set of things you're putting in it, and crucially, the order in which you add them. Now I want you to think again, I'm asking again, think carefully about the relationship between a linked list and a binary search tree, and think about what happens, how the ordering of these elements can um, relate to the question I asked you. Okay, um, yep. Oh, Steve, I think we got the answer from Felix. So a LinkedIn list is a tree list, uh, a tree with at most one node. The binary, yeah. So I would repeat that again. A LinkedIn list is, a, I think he actually wanted to say a binary list with at, at most one node. Okay, still not quite getting there. What, uh, what, I, what I wanted you to think about is what happens, okay, here's a very, very concrete thing. For this tree here, what would happen if I put everything into the tree, I added the tree in alphabetical order, added ap apple first, then apricot, then banana, then cherry, then grape, then mango, then orange, then peach, then pear, then plum. What would the shape of the tree be, folks? If I started this tree with apple, then added apricot, banana, cherry, grape, mango, orange, peach, pear, plum what would it look like? This is a really important question. Um, Zena say the linked list with ordered elements is a binary search tree. A linked list with, n no, <laughs> it's um, still not there. And here's one from Joshua. Um, he just answered your question just now. It would be a LinkedIn list. That's exactly right. Okay, we've got it. We've got the answer here. If you added the elements in alphabetical order, you get a linked list, okay? So a linked list is a kind of, is, is an instance of a binary search tree. A linked list is a binary search tree with a special property of, of each one happening to only have either zero or one nodes. The last one will have zero and all the rest of them will have one, okay? And so that, and that can actually literally happen. If you get unlucky when you're adding things to a tree and you happen to add them in the wrong order, you will end up with a linked list. And what's bad about that? Well, what's bad about that is you end up with what we started with, which is a really, really bad um, organization, right? Um, because it takes a long time to find things. So the property of a tree is very nice, but if you add things in the wrong order, then it all goes bad. So let's have a look here. We're gonna add an apple. 
add an orange, it's higher than apple, so it goes to the right. Add a banana, it's higher than an apple, so it goes to the right, but it's lower than orange, so it goes to the left. Add a pear, goes over there. Add an apricot, and so forth. And don't forget, you've got to search to see if the thing you want is already in there. So we look for a grape, and we go down there, and it goes on the right of cherry. And um, we're going to check if it contains orange. We've got to search. We go to the right of apple. And um, there it is. We search for grape and we look all the way down the tree until we get to grape. And there it is. Search for fig and we look through the tree. We get to grape and there's nothing there. It's not equal to grape and grape has no children. We can't go any further. Fig is not in the tree. Okay. Now uh, the mini quiz, I'll do the mini quiz for this. And then we're going to um, publish this poll here. Then what we're going to do is go on and uh, think finish up for um, with the bios and what we're going to do um, next week is go and do the implementation of the set we'll do have to do that next friday okay so let's go through the bio and today's bio is ada lovelace hopefully you've heard of ada lovelace there's even a programming language named after ada okay ada lovelace you can read a lot about ada um, much has been written about her um, she um, <clears throat> There's something wrong with the date on that screen there. I just noticed the date is completely uh, uh, the, the, There's something wrong with the, the, the years of her birth and death. Um, I'm not exactly sure when she died, but she's from a long, long time ago. And she was one of the first um, people. She's arguably the first person to write a computer program. So you definitely need to know about Ada Lovelace. So she um, worked with a guy called Babbage and um, Babbage very roughly speaking, what happened was Babbage designed a computation engine. It wasn't electronic, it was mechanical. And the thing that was interesting about it was general purpose. Okay, so it meant you could actually write programs. And Ada worked very closely with him via correspondence and um, essentially formulated the concept of a program and wrote programs or algorithms um, for this machine. So very, very interesting character. And like I said, there's quite a few books written about, or there's a lot of articles and some books written about Ada Lovelace and, um, and uh, Charles Babbage. Very interesting person. And with that, we've finished the lecture. And um, I wish you all a very uh, good rest of the week. I know you've got another deliverable on Friday, but um, after that, you do have a long weekend. So I hope you have a great long weekend. And then we're going to meet uh, the Friday after that. So we've got a break now from lectures for um, uh, um, nearly two weeks. So we're going to meet in Friday in a week's time. Okay, so have a great uh, break and I'll see you all then.